Hello, Alex here, and in this video I want to talk about my first roll of Harman Phoenix 200, a brand new colour film from the equally brand new Harman Photo, which I shot in the Leica M4P. Let's get into it. For those unfamiliar with the corporate structure of Harman and Ilford, the very short version is that the company we now call Ilford was founded in 1879 and bought and renamed a few times over the years, before eventually going into receivership in about 2004, just after their 125th anniversary. Receivership is broadly somewhat similar to bankruptcy, but not really the same thing. The intellectual and physical assets of the company were split up, and the company was essentially split into the two branches that we have now. Ilford Imaging, which is the German branch, and Harman Technology, which is the company that trades as Ilford Photo, the Ilford we know and love, and has created this new Harman Photo. So why do I bring this up? Well, the company has had a bit of a rough and bumpy history at times over the last nearly century and a half, and this represents a significant milestone for them, the reintroduction of colour film into their portfolio. I'm obviously a bit too young to have used, you know, Ilford Color Film Type D or Ilfochrome or Cibachrome for printing. So uh, it's very exciting to see a completely brand new player in the modern color film market. Phoenix is a limited edition 35mm film that Harman have developed in just 12 months. I've had three research and development R&D jobs in the past in the chemical industry, and let me tell you, doing anything in a year is shockingly fast. It is absolutely bonkers that they were able to put together a colour film in a year. Even having all the manufacturing expertise for black and white film, this is a whole other level. Harman say that the film gives a real analogue look with strong contrast, a lot of grain, and really punchy, high saturation colours. They say that it has some shortcomings and they're quite open about that, with things like coating anomalies to be expected and that the look will vary depending on the scanner settings used. To this end, they have actually provided recommended scanner settings, a link to the PDF of which I will put down below once it goes public, to help you get the best out of it, because this film is coated on a, tr a transparent polyester base without an orange mask, so this is not a traditional colour negative film. The actual film base has a sort of yellow green sickly colour and the negatives take on a very pale violet or lavender tone after development. Phoenix is designed for development in the standard C41 chemical process which does yield negatives that have to be inverted either during the scanning or printing process to yield your final positive images. It has an ISO rating of 200 and it is only available in the 35mm format as 36 exposure rolls loaded into metal cans that are DX coded so they can communicate the frame count and ISO to your camera. Going back to the lack of an orange mask in the base, that really caught me off guard because I had assumed that there was a bit of hidden subtext in the Instagram hype posts with that orange and red colour, presumably referencing an orange mask of a colour negative film. I mean, that's how we realised, we the people realised, that it was a colour film that we're making. The other colour film that most people would know, or might know, that lacks an orange mask is Kodak's Aero Colour 2460, sold as Luminaire 100, Flick Film Electra, Film Washi X, Santa Color, Santa Film 100, and I'm sure there are others. That film also needs a little bit of work with scanning because the lack of an orange mask means it isn't natively supported by your standard auto settings in most scanners. And this is why Harman have provided recommended scanner settings to help people get the most out of it. Before we talk about how I shot my first roll of Phoenix, we'll talk about the three main things that Harman say you should bear in mind when you're shooting it yourself. The first is to shoot in good and consistent light, which I presume means to avoid mixed lighting like daylight and incandescent or tungsten fluorescent or whatever. The second is to rate the film properly, meter it properly, meter for your midtones, don't expose for the shadows or any of that kind of thing. They say to meter it for 200, though you could rate it at 100 or 400, but they strongly recommend 200. The third thing is to shoot subjects that fill the frame. We'll see what that means in practice in a bit. 
When I got the film, I was already borrowing my friend's Leica M4P and a couple of other Voigtlander M-mount lenses from other friends because I wanted to try the system out, see how I get on with it just because I could. As the Leica M4P doesn't have an internal light meter, I used my Sekonic L758DR for metering and I rated the film at EI200. I tried to shoot a bit of everything with this roll. Cats, portraits, landscapes, architecture, a bit of deliberately mixed lighting, some overexposure, some underexposure, and just to try and get a feel for it under a range of different circumstances. Then I developed the film using the Bellini 3 bath C41 kit, scanned it with the Fujifilm GFX 100S, and inverted with Negative Lab Pro. On the note of scanning, when it came to DSLR or DSLM scanning, I had no problems whatsoever. I used Negative Lab Pro V3 and either with or without roll analysis, I was getting pretty much the same results. It was great, it handled it really well. The only thing I would say about scanning is that with Negative Lab Pro, it often leaned a little bit to magenta. I had to bring things down by like three points to five points for most shots. Not a lot, but just to know that the auto white balance leaned a little bit too far in that direction. But honestly, getting great colors out of the box that easily, that's pretty good. So the obvious, it's a brand new and completely original color film. We have a new player in the color film market and that alone is worth a lot. I've also just got confirmation of the price, which will be about 11 to $12, about 13 to 14 euros, which will obviously vary depending on your retailer. So it's quite affordable, which is actually surprising given the lack of economy of scale that Harman will have to produce this film. Although I had absolutely fantastic results that needed almost no effort with Negative Lab Pro and DSLR scanning, most people would probably be getting their stuff developed at a lab and getting lab scans. So the fact that Harman have gone out of their way to test a range of different scanners and provide recommended scanner settings and profiles for labs to use to help them get the most out of the film is a huge deal. You might remember when Aero Color became a lot more popular and everyone started reselling it. There were a lot of people getting a lot of really bad scans because there weren't recommendations on how to process it and scan it to kind of get the best out of it. Harman have kind of preempted that here and that should help people get great results pretty much immediately. Harman were right in that the film really doesn't like underexposure, but that's the same for any color negative film, especially really kind of lower tier budget films. I think they've undersold how well it tolerates overexposure though, because in at least one shot, I was able to deliberately overexpose by four stops, that's rating the film at EI 12 essentially, and got perfectly good results. Sorry, Remy. The polyester base is very clear and there's no orange mask as I said, which means that the film could be suitable for reversal processing to make slides. And that clear base, in spite of being very, very clear, didn't give me any problems with light piping, which is a very common problem with Kodak AeroColor. I actually loaded the same roll into both cameras for my B-roll because I was afraid that that light would fog and ruin the film. But no, even in the leader there's no trace of light piping whatsoever, which is great. Reciprocity failure performance seems really good. I'd run a quick test with three shots that metered one eighth of a second, one second and eight seconds because I wasn't sure where the reciprocity failure would start to kick in. For the one second exposure and the one eighth of a second exposure, I applied no reciprocity failure correction. And then for the eight second exposure, I used the fairly standard X is to 1.3 factor, giving me a 15 second exposure, about a stop. The one eighth of a second and 15 second exposures came out pretty much identically dense, but the one second exposure is a little bit thinner. So that tells us two things right off the bat. The film has a standard level of reciprocity failure in terms of long exposures, X is to 1.3, works absolutely fantastically. The other thing is that reciprocity failure does come in at one second or half a second, I would say. So you do need to give it maybe a third or half a stop if you're doing a one second exposure and then do your 1.3 from there just to kind of give you a ballpark of what to expect. Overall, a very strong performance and better than a lot of cheap films. I put this last because I know not everybody likes halation, but as far as films with halation go, I find that the slightly more yellow, orangish tint to the halation with this film, at least in daytime shots, makes it a lot more versatile and 
It's a bit less offensive than the deep blood red halation of something like Cinesil 400D shot in the daytime. At nighttime it goes quite red and that's fair, but during the daytime, that's just a white balance thing, but during the daytime I find it a lot more versatile and with 400D I find the halation ruins a lot of daytime shots, with this film, not really the case. There is a lot of grain and resolution is not that good. Personally, in my mind, there are two types of film. Your ultra highly technically proficient true to life films, CMS20, Velvia, that kind of thing. And creative effect stuff with, you know, coarser grain, sometimes halation, that kind of thing. And this is definitely in the latter camp. And this is where Harmon's suggestion to shoot subjects that fill the frame comes from. Because with the low resolution, you really want to make your subject as big as is reasonably possible in the frame to kind of compensate for that. None of this is to say that the film is unusably soft or anything like that, but if you're looking to capture a landscape, you are going to lose fine detail in the trees in the distance, for example. For reasonably close subjects, it's not actually an issue in practice for a normal viewing size and for a normal print, but it is worth noting that compared to other films, it's not going to do as well. That polyester base is thinner than a standard acetate base, which means that some electronic auto load cameras can struggle with it. For example, I actually had to load the X-Pan twice before it would catch and actually start unloading the film. That's fairly normal for polyester bases, but it's not normal for Ilford slash Harman products, so it's worth pointing out. Although I do think it handles mixed lighting and various types of lighting far better than Harman seemed to suggest, because I was kind of worried that it would only look good in direct sunlight, which is not the case at all, a certain type of artificial light just gives you a swathe of green with no actual information in any of the other channels realistically. There's nothing you can really do to correct it because it just renders those lights as green, green, green with a bit more green. It's a limited run film and they're probably going to stop making it fairly soon. If it took them one year to make this stuff, they're probably already working on the next film and that might be starting in a year or so again, which means we might only have about nine to ten months with this film if you want to try it and actually shoot it. So the lack of availability long term could be said to be a con. You can bring a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. And Harman doing all of this excellent work to provide scanner details and profiles and calibration and whatever for all these different types of scanners that different labs will have won't mean anything if they don't actually use it. So you're hopefully you're relying on the lab hopefully actually using this information to get the best out of the film. And there is a possibility that a bad lab could give bad lab scans and put someone off the film kind of unjustly. This is my third favorite picture from the role, just a portrait that I took when I was walking down the beach. I saw this guy with his, the scarf matching his beard and the jacket and hat matching his skin more or less with sort of a duochrome kind of look and I thought it made a nice contrast against the blue sky so I asked him if I could take his portrait. You can see here that it did lean a little bit purple and magenta in the sky. I didn't fix that for this video but it would be relatively easy to fix and it's not a big deal. Compositionally, it's quite nice. He's looking into the light and out of frame, and I think having his head slightly off center works quite well for this. Shooting portraits with a 35mm lens is quite new to me, and it was something that I wasn't sure would work out, but it did. I took my second favorite shot from the roll at sunset up in Hoth, again with the 35mm, but there were these dark clouds rolling in kind of um, from the north, north northeast, uh, which kind of soured the lower half of the frame, so I did have to crop it a bit, which was a bit unfortunate. The halation works well here, adding a bit of a glow around the railings in particular, and the overall colour palette of the image is very appealing. I think the film did a really good job capturing this scene. This is by far my favourite shot from the role, taking advantage of the frosty morning to go for a walk and seeing this wheelbarrow in the green. It's all just shades of green, but in a nice way. And the frost adding a lot of cool tones to the image, and there's a decent contrast and really nice focus fall off from that boat line, the 35mm. It's just a really nice shot. So my usual question, who is this film for and would I recommend it? For someone who likes the analog look, the low-mo, lo-fi look with high contrast, lots of grain, maybe enjoys expired film or just isn't concerned about getting every last line pair per millimeter out of their lenses. It's a pretty easy recommendation because it has the look, so to speak. I, I personally do find it very appealing overall and Although I wouldn't use it for paid work personally or 
documenting landscapes in particular because that loss of fine detail and distances isn't really for me. For portraits, street photography, cat photos and the like, I think it works really nicely as a kind of a classic look for lack of a better word and I know that's going to rub some people the wrong way. Uh, as an alternative, given the good reciprocity failure performance, you could use it as a low light film, you know, a lower speed film for certain purposes. Uh, for very, very long exposures, very high ISO films tend to have worse um, reciprocity failure characteristics, again, to the very, very long exposures compared to lower ISO films like Portra 160 is better than Portra 800 past a certain point. So it could do something like that, albeit a bit grainy, it would still work and potentially work for certain use cases. Of course, you could also use it, say, with a wide aperture with flash um, at a lower ISO rating for nighttime photography if you were into that kind of thing without needing to use an ND filter, for example. Lastly, it's also technically the best and only tungsten balanced slide film on the market. But more about that in the other video. Do I recommend it though? Absolutely. If you can spare the money, buy one roll to show your support for the project. Harman have done an incredible thing getting this out in one year. It's absolutely ridiculous and they have my utmost respect as someone with a level of in experience in R&D. Even if this film isn't quite to your liking, the fact that it's pretty affordable, it's like Kodak Gold kind of prices, but a bit more punchy, contrasty, higher saturation, it's got more of a distinctive look to it than Kodak Gold, I think that's worth something to certain people. And especially in the States where it seems to be a bit cheaper than it is here, it's very easy to recommend. Phoenix is the first of hopefully many color negative films to come from Harman Photo and is a signal of their intent that they are taking color negative manufacturing very, very seriously. Yes, this film has a lot of shortcomings and they have been extremely forthright with acknowledging and telling you about them so you know what you're getting into. But they have gone from zero to this in one year. So if they're gonna keep making steps like that, it's not going to take them long to get to the top of the mountain or the figurative ladder or whatever metaphor you would like to use. They're making huge strides in an extremely short amount of time and I'm really excited to see what they do next. I will personally be shooting a lot more of Phoenix in the weeks to come. I think it pairs really well with Double X, that kind of grainy look with uh, good contrast and some halation. So I'm going to commit for 35mm colour negative film specifically, this is the only film I'm going to shoot until my next birthday. So uh, I think that's everything I have to say about my first roll of Harman Phoenix 200. So I'll see you in the other video very soon. Otherwise, stay safe and bye bye for now. If you don't already, follow me on Instagram at shaka1277 for new pictures every day. If you liked this video and enjoy what I do on the channel, please consider subscribing or checking out my Patreon where the tiers start at just one euro per month.